All right, Norma Jean, it's hard to follow that. Good morning. This morning, every day is a good day when we see the light. That being said, Norma Jean Almodovar has been a sex worker rights activist since 1982 when she left a 10-year career with the Los Angeles Police Department. Ooh, scares me to even say that word. <laughs> to become a call girl. Her intent from the beginning was to point out the societal, hip societal hypocrisy and apathy toward prostitution that allowed police corruption to flourish. The book she began writing when she was still with the department ultimately cost her seven years of her life as she battled with the LAPD and the LA District Attorney. There's another two words that make me shudder. <laughs> who tried to stop her from getting her, the book published. After spending 18 months in prison with the Manson family women, her book was finally published with Simon & Schuster in 1994. She was an NGO delegate to the 1995 UN Women's Conference in Beijing, China, and a speaker at the 1999 AIDS Conference in Geneva. She was co-chair and co-organizer for the 1997 International Conference on Prostitution, ICOP, with the Cal State University Northridge. In 2000, she was the only sex worker invited to participate in former U.S. Surgeon General David Satcher's conference on promoting responsible sexual behavior in 2000, and has been a guest lecturer at many colleges and universities across the U.S., and has been interviewed well over 1,000 times on radio and television through the past 28 years. She has been the executive director of Coyote LA since 1982, and in 1997, she also co-founded the International Sex Worker Foundation for Art, Culture, and Education, of which she is still president. And I can't say too much more. I read Norma Jean's book. She is awesome. Give it up for Norma Jean Amadovan. I'm from representing Ice Face. I have to do a little Ice Face uh, stuff for, before I get into what I've got to say. Uh, what Ice Face is about is art, culture, and education. Now, the education part isn't the education of sex workers, it's the education of the public because, you know, that's who we need to educate. But the art and culture is the art created by us, about us past and present from around the world. And so one of the things that I do as the ice face person, I create little things like this 2011 day planner, um, which has got a lot of the art uh, and little blurbs about uh, prostitution rehabilitation, about Baskin Robbins and about the old fighting the traffic and young girls, which uh, started in 1911. I mean, it's, this whole thing about trafficking, it's been around forever. And uh, so I have a sample up here, and you can find out how to buy it here, but I do have about uh, 10 of the little calendars, which are not quite as detailed, but anyway, that kind of stuff. And you can pick up these flyers for um, a number of the different people that contact me during the year. There's Aphrodite's Trade for Business and Pleasure, uh, the History of Modern Pornography, and the T-shirts, which... <coughs> I designed in Photoshop too. This is Elliot Spitzer, hypocrite at large. Another do as I say, not as I do politician. You can see some of the t-shirts I have over here. So, and also, um, I didn't bring quite enough, but I have at least 25 of these. These are the, uh, the thing I'm giving out to some of the legislators tonight. It's the consequences of arbitrary and selective enforcement of prostitution laws. And uh, that's what I'm going to be speaking about here really quickly. And it's got like all the different news articles that will just absolutely make you sick. Okay, and you can pick them up over here, they're free. Okay, so there's a couple of things I have to say before I get into what I've got to say. And, and the first thing is that not all cops are bad. I know that. For a fact, I try to remember it, um, but they're not. They're not all bad. I mean, for a lot of them, it's just a job. Just like when people talk about our job, and they, you know, they try to put all kinds of things on it, 
and we try to tell them, it's just a job, people, get over it. Well, the cops didn't say that. Some of them. Um, so the first thing I want to say is not all cops are bad. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I believe that bad laws can make all cops and any cop bad. And we have to change these laws because the corruption that goes on within law enforcement makes it so that I am terrified still, 20 years after I got out of prison, I am terrified of driving down the street and I see a police car and I think, oh my God, are they gonna try to stop me? What are they gonna try to get me on? I don't do anything illegal, you know? I mean, <sighs> I take care of my disabled husband. I stay at home. Um, I don't work at this. I work at taking care of my husband. Um, but I still have terror when I see a police car. The other day I was uh, at Rite Aid. I'm sure you guys know you have them someplace. It's a drugstore. And uh, these two female police officers undercover were buying something in there and then they were coming out of the store behind me and they were just... I had to restrain myself from turning to them and saying something nasty because it's in me to want to tell them off because I'm pretty sure they were working undercover vice. And I wanted to say something to them, but you know what? I had to think better of it because otherwise I'd be in jail right now and I couldn't come up here, so, you know, I had to behave. Um, but everyone who works in a system where you work against the law, you must at times, like I felt when I was working, be absolutely terrified. Because what they do to us, what they can do to us, what they do do to us, what they did to me, um, it's not anything I will ever get over. You know, I mean, it's been 20 years since I was incarcerated, but you know what, it's like it was last year, last month. I still have nightmares. I still dream about being there with the Manson family women. I still dream about those women that ask you, Hey, uh, Jean, I, I killed my husband and I burned my house down. What are you in here for? Um, uh, oh, um, I tried to get my friend Penny laid for money. Oh, God, I don't believe you. It's true. Everybody laughed. You know, I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world to try to tell somebody that you're there because you had a conversation with someone. No, you didn't force her. No, you didn't put a knife to her throat. Nothing happened. The only thing that took place was a conversation. And you end up in solitary confinement. I was lucky. Solitary is all I got. Unfortunately, some of the other women uh, that I, I've been working on this other book, you, you, you know about my first book, Cop to Call a Girl, and that's no longer available in, except at Amazon, uh, now and then when you can find a copy. I've been working on another book, it's called, <coughs> well the academic title is Police, Prostitution and Politics, Commercial Sex Scandals in America, but it's going to have a much more down-to-earth title called Cops, Hoes, Preachers, and Politicos. And it covers the gamut of, you know, all the interaction. And of course, you know, I think these guys, like George Reckers, I think they do it on purpose just so they can be in my book. What else am I to think? You know, I mean, Elliot Spencer, what was he thinking? He goes out there and he, he puts prostitution rings in jail and demands that justice be done. And he's out there busting the competition for his service, that is, of course. You know, I mean, it's really, these guys, what's the matter with them? Well, what's the matter with them is that they have to deal with bad laws. And unfortunately, bad laws turn politicians, cops, 
and preachers into a bunch of hypocrites. And they stand and they preach one thing and they tell you, oh, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Prostitution, it's evil, it's exploitative, and we need to eradicate prostitution. Meanwhile, they've got the number of the latest, you know, girl that they're seeing or the boy that they're seeing, you know, and they're going to call them right after the, you know, they get off of work. So, unfortunately, as long as we have these kinds of laws, we have things like, well, let's see. I'm sure you guys have all heard the term NHI. You know, you know about that, right? Anybody not know what it means? No humans involved. That is what they call the murder of prostitutes. No humans involved. It's an NHI. That's an um, unofficial police term that they use. Uh, and there was a major case in 1992 in San Diego where they had about 45 women that were victims of murder. We think a lot of them were actually victims of murder at the hands of some of the cops. Um, unfortunately, none of the cops got arrested or went to jail for it. In fact, one of the cops that was uh, Donna Gentili's um, paramour, and she was his informant. He's still working for the San Diego Police Department. He was promoted, and he may now have been retired, I don't know, but at least when I was working on my research, he was still there. Um, but she had re taped, uh, made a tape recording that she was afraid that she was going to be retaliated against because she squealed on the cop. Because the cops were extorting them for sexual favors and she got tired of it. So she died. So, then we have cops who become lawyers, who become judges. And then these judges, when a prostitute comes before them who is the victim of a rape, the judge says, the law does not protect prostitutes. We don't give rights to prostitutes. This woman, he's a woman who goes out on the street, makes a whore out of herself, opens herself up to anybody. She steps outside the protection of the law. That's a basic and fundamental legal concept. This is a guy who was formerly an LAPD officer. Lovely man, huh? Then we have, um, <clears throat> cops, and when cops aren't available, they can hire nice gentlemen from the community to have sex with a prostitute and then make an arrest. And the cops actually do this and get paid for having sex on duty. So, what does that make the cop? A prostitute! Right? What does it make the guy that's being paid, he's, he's not a cop, but he goes in, he's paid $300 for each encounter. He has the money from the cops to pay the prostitute. He gets off, he, ha he gets paid, then he goes to court and testifies against the prostitute and says, Your Honor, she's a whore! Oh my God, I'm really? And what are you, Buster? And courts have upheld that it's okay. It is okay for cops to have sex with prostitutes. Up in Spokane, this particular judge, uh, Daniel Maggs, ruled police agents may engage in sex to carry out prostitution investigations as long as they don't try to trap anyone into the crime. These cops spent $2,000 for two agents to engage in sex acts for evidence, and that does not count as entrapment. Okay. Okay, so now, what happens when you have laws which allow the police? I mean, this is the problem with the kinds of laws that we have. I mean, not that we should have any laws against private consenting adult commercial sex, but the kinds of laws that we have 
make it possible for the police to pick and choose who they will arrest and who they won't arrest, who gets to go free. How do they make those choices? Who cooperates? That's how they make their choices. I mean, when they arrested me and charged me with one count of pandering when I tried to help my friend Penny get laid for money, <coughs> excuse me, when they appealed my probation after the judge had given me probation, after I spent 50 days in solitary confinement being studied to see if I was dangerous to society, and it turned out I wasn't dangerous, so he put me on probation. But the DA appealed it on the grounds that my crime was worse than rape or robbery because I was commercially exploiting my law enforcement past to draw on scandalous escapades that undermine respect for the law. But the problem was that he said that my crime was even worse than average because I was trying to help this poor, unattractive woman who, at best, as, as he described her, a, a um, linebacker for a football team. That's how he described it. And so that it was actually very cruel of me to offer to pay her to have sex with one of my clients. <laughs> I mean, I, actually, I was paying him to have sex with her because he didn't want to have sex with her. No good deed goes unpunished, believe me. <clears throat> so, while he is prosecuting me and saying, I need to go to prison under the mandatory three to six year prison term on the first offense with no prior convictions, Madam Alex, who was Heidi Fleiss's predecessor, was a very happy madam in Hollywood. She was the Beverly Hills madam. I mean, she was around forever. She had all the best clients. I mean, she had Don Simpson and, I mean, she had them. And the cops didn't arrest her until one day she stopped giving information to Fred Clapp, who was, by the way, the cop that busted me. And yes, there's a really bad joke about Fred Clapp and being, in, you know, a vice cop. <laughs> but I won't say that here. <laughs> anyway, Madam Alex, what she did to get out of going to prison under the mandatory law, she called all the cops to the stand that she was an informant for. And it worked. They didn't send her to prison, in fact. Daniel Watt, who was a detective, he testified at her hearing that she was the best informant he had ever met. And he said, she had enough class not to flaunt her brothel activities and the department looked the other way because of the help she provided on numerous criminal cases. You don't get that cut type of information from a church person, he testified. <laughs> So as long as she provided information to the police, she was allowed to exploit those poor girls that were only making, what, $5,000 an hour, those poor pitiful girls. I mean, my God. I mean, I thought I was being exploited. I was only making $500 an hour, but $5,000, I mean, man, those girls should have been arrested and gone to jail so they could understand how exploited they were. <laughs> but no, they didn't get arrested. She got arrested because she stopped giving the information to Fred Clapp. He got pissed off and he wrote into her little file, no contact, inactive, should go to jail. But guess what, she didn't go to jail. She instead, got probation, and while she was on probation, I used, to, I used to drive her to down to the courthouse every Friday, and this woman was an absolute character. She passed away about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, I know. She, um, I, she never drove a car in her life, but she looked like somebody's grandmother. I mean, she was this short, little, balding Filipino woman, and you'd never, in your wildest imagination, dream she was a madman. So I used to take her down to uh, court on Fridays, which was when she was having her hearings, and she used to take a box of Kleenex with her. 
And she'd sit there in court with a box of Kleenex and she, well, she had cocaine in that Kleenex. <laughs> she was sitting there in front of the judge and in front of the cop. It's not her cocaine. And if, if I had realized it when she was doing that, I don't think I would have driven her down to court because she was in my car with cocaine and I just got out of prison. <sighs> But she did not go to prison, and um, she got probation. And while she was on probation, she offered me that little black book. And she really did have a little black book. And she put it in another Kleenex box that she kept on her bed. And she sat on her bed and ruled the whole entire empire in Beverly Hills. And um, I thanked her profusely for her generous offer. And I said, no, Madam Alex, I just called her Alex. I said, um, to be honest with you, I don't want to be a police informant. And if I had your little black book, the only way I wouldn't be in prison for the rest of my life is if I was an informant. It wasn't long after that that Heidi Fleiss stole that little black book and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, the whole thing about Heidi Fleiss's arrest was just simply a business deal or a business dispute gone wrong. Um, Alex called up her friend, Detective Sammy Lee, and she said, Sammy, Heidi stole my book. I want you to arrest her. She should go to jail. <laughs> now, Heidi, being high on drugs, didn't remember that she knew Detective Sammy Lee and that Sammy Lee was a cop. So when she started getting these phone calls from Sammy Lee and he set her up with all these supposed businessmen from Hawaii, she fell for it. And then of course, after she got arrested, if she had shut her mouth and become an informant like Madam Alex, nothing would have happened. But she didn't, she said, I'm not going to go to jail. I'm going to tell everybody who these guys are that are my clients. Well, there was a uh, report. Excuse me. <coughs> a reporter for the LA Times named Sean Hoopler, who happens not to like prostitutes very much. And she did an interview with Heidi, and she got Heidi to say she was going to name names, and of course, the rest is history as far as Heidi Fleiss is concerned. The story got picked up, it went around the world, and all of a sudden, Heidi was Heidi Fleiss. But anyway, these are all because we have bad laws, and because these bad laws lead to bad cops. Now, um, I know you guys, anybody from Southern California, Beside me, okay. You guys might know about the um, case that we just had down there back in April, and it was these two cops, one off duty from the, I guess he's from the Westminster Police Department, and the other was a corrections officer. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And um, they're off duty. It's like, you know, Saturday, they get drunk, they start real early in the day. By the time five o'clock comes along, they're plowed. So they go to the uh, Ontario Mall and they see a young girl, probably in a skimpy uniform. She just, she was a waitress, she just got off work. So the one cop, um, Anthony Orban, or Orban, I think that's his name, he um, kidnaps her at the point of the gun, drives her to another mall, rapes her repeatedly, sticks a gun in her mouth, threatens to kill her, takes pictures of her, sends them to his buddy, and then she manages, because he gets a phone call, she manages to get out of the car and run away. I know they thought she was a prostitute. I know they did. I know they probably saw her skimpy costume and think she's a prostitute. We can, we can rape her without any worries and it won't be a problem. Unfortunately for them, she wasn't. She was a waitress. And also unfortunately for them, Anthony uh, calls his buddy, comes to pick him up over at the Ontario Mall, and Anthony leaves his 
gun in her car. The, not the smartest cop in the woods. So um, she calls the police. They come take a report. He's over in Ontario. He calls his wife and he says, I lost my gun or it got stolen or something. So she calls the cops and they come out to take a report to him. So pretty soon you have her taking this report with the cops talking about her being raped and these two guys and, and there's the gun in the car and the gun has his name on it. <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short, those guys are both in jail and they will probably spend a very long time behind bars. On the other hand, if they had done that to a prostitute, most likely they would be out in six months because that's about the going rate for cops that rape prostitutes and get caught. And the reason they get to rape prostitutes is because they can threaten us. Just like when I was at work furlough after I'd been in prison for 18 months and I'm at work furlough and I get to go home on the weekends and be with the man I love, my husband. And there was a corrections officer there and he is kind of used to um, having his way with the women that come through this work for low place because most of them are doing drugs. Now, I've never done drugs in my life. I don't care if people do drugs. It, you know, it's your body, it's your choice. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't use drugs. I'm just a whore, that's all I am. I'm just real square, you know. I, I serve, I save all my energy for one vice. So I've never done drugs. I haven't even smoked pot. I don't care if people smoke pot. It doesn't bother me, but I don't do it. So he thought, because I was a prostitute, of course, that I would really love to give him blow jobs and he could give me clean urine for a urine test. And I had to tell him that, sorry, sweetie, I don't take urine tests because I'm not here for drug use. So then he said, well, if you want to go home on weekends, you're going to have to put out. I said, oh, okay. Because it was either that or go back to prison through the rest of my sentence. And I decided it was more convenient to put out. And it took me a long, long time to recognize that as rape. But it was right, and it was because I did not consent to it. And when people, when these feminists and these conservatives tell me that prostitution is rape, I'm going, you've never been raped, have you? Because rape is rape, and prostitution is sex for money, and it is not rape. And how fucking dare you? Excuse my language, I, I still haven't gotten over speaking like a cop. I used to swear like, oh God. You should have seen me in prison though. I mean, you know, it was really funny because I'm very, very quiet. I'm very, very shy and introverted. I know you can't believe it now, but it's true. So when I was in prison, all these girls were in there for lots of really bad things. And they like, don't you swear around Norma Jean. And I'm like, fuck honey, I swear louder and worse than you do. But they, you know, they didn't know that. But um, truly, people don't understand that if you consent for whatever reason to have sex with someone, it is not rape. It is not. You may not tell me it is. You may not say my experience is anything but what I tell you it is because it is my body. I am a grown woman. I have been through a lot of things. You may not usurp my experience and say it's anything but what I say it is. And that's why we have to change these laws. We have to decriminalize all consenting adult commercial sex. We have to do it because we have to stop the police corruption. I mean, back to what I started with. I don't know how much longer I've got. I'll take some questions, but 
There are good cops out there. These guys don't want to have to arrest prostitutes. They don't want to have to arrest people who are using drugs. They want to arrest people who are murdering other people. They want to arrest people who are raping other people. They don't want to go out and spend their time busting others. They think it's a, a big joke. So we have four minutes? Four minutes. When I worked Hollywood Division and I went to the roll calls, we had uh, the guys would have this thing about, okay, who gets the whore car tonight? And what it was is the guys that got assigned to the whore car would go up to Hollywood Boulevard and they would round up all the prostitutes and make them take off their high heels and run across the street. The last one across the street went to jail that night. That's how they decide who goes to jail. And we have got to stop that kind of thing. I mean, the law needs to be there for serious reasons when there are serious crimes committed against other people. But to have a law that allows the police to have such an arbitrary way of enforcing it can only and always lead to corruption. And we have to stop that. And um, so if you guys uh, want to get a copy of this, uh, and if you, if, if you run out and you still want to see what I got to say, you can go to the iSpace website. It's um, www.iswface.org. And you can, I'll have it posted up there and you can download it. I'm sorry I didn't get it put up before I came, but huh, you know, I'm, I'm taking care of my husband and uh, you know, I'm not doing that well myself. I'm gonna be 60 next year. Yeah. Holy fuck. Us all whores, you know, back when we first started in this 28 years ago, I mean, it would have been really great to see all you young, enthusiastic whores out there. Where were you? Oh, that's right, you were, you were too young to do this work back then. <laughs> we would have been uh, child prostitution. Boy, oh boy, what the Donna Hughes and company have us behind bars for the rest of our natural lives. Anyway, um, if anybody has any questions, I will take questions. Uh, uh, yeah, can you take yeah. the one off the podium and give it to Norma yeah. and yeah. then put the... Can we do it this way? We can, okay. Okay. So if you have any questions, you can take a line up here. I will answer anything. <laughs> I I'm totally over being you know modest when you when you do your bodily functions in front of eight other women in a cell <laughs> you lose all your inhibitions really quickly either that or they start laughing at you yes they did laugh at me I know it's true okay nobody has any questions nobody um by the way uh, while I was incarcerated, I was on 60 Minutes, and I did post 60 Minutes interview up on YouTube, so if you just put my name in a search engine, you'll find that particular interview, a couple other ones that I did in the past. But anyway, that was so long ago and so far away, and I'm sure that the cops will probably want to send me to prison for the next book I write about them. And um, I'm going to do my best not to go back, though. And so I, I may have to come up to Canada. I know there's some sex workers from Canada. I may have to run up there. <laughs> All right. You guys want to shelter me? All right. Norma Jean, how's the three strikes law affecting the prostitution laws on that? Because I know California is really, really strict on the three strikes law. They are, but the three strikes law at present just affects um, the felonies. I mean, if they get you, I mean, for well, four misdemeanors make a felony. Well, that's true, but that would be one felony. Then you'd have to have three more. But as far as something like pandering, I'm a convicted felon panderer. So, yeah, that would affect me very much if I were charged with two right, more felonies. Right, because you've got the wobbler out there yeah. as well. Yep. And what the wobbler does is they can take a misdemeanor charge, and if you have prior felony yeah. convictions, can just rack it up on your ass yes, and they gone can. for yes, life. They can. So, Although I am in uh, September 12th, I'm hoping I will be pardoned by the governor. Arnold. 
Uh, everybody knows Arnold used to use our services, and Arnold used to be a whore. He did it long before he became famous, and now he's out there telling us about crime. Oh yeah, <clears throat> I'm a convicted felon, and I am about. I am. I almost lost the ability to be paid to take care of my husband. My husband became disabled three years ago, and because I am a convicted felon, Arnold wanted to stop anybody like me from being caregivers in the, in the uh, California in-home support services group, which is what I get paid to take care of my husband. I don't get paid a whole lot. <laughs> it just barely covers our rent, but you know, he wanted to take it away, so I will be getting pardoned in September. Then I can't go around and say I'm a convicted felon anymore. Trats. Oh well. So, so you have to get a pardon. You can't go through the courts. To get I have to get a pardon. Yeah. I have to get a pardon from Texas. So I know where you yeah. are, girlfriend. So anyway. I'm jealous. Because you're getting because I'm getting a pardon? <laughs> that is such great news. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For getting much. a pardon? I don't want a pardon. I like going around saying I'm a convicted felon. You know, hey, it scares people. Come on. Yeah. You know what? It makes me think if Jerry Brown becomes governor, maybe the hell we'll all get pardoned. Well, that's true. <laughs> but you see, it's all. I what do that. I say when I go to parties? Not that I go to parties, but I'm, you know, I can't be like, a convicted felon. Hey, look, you say, hey, I'm a pardoned convicted felon. Prostitute. Thank you very much. That doesn't have quite the pizzazz, but okay. Okay, no, it does. No, I'll take the pardon. I will, because that way I get to take care of my husband. I so. love you. Go get that damn pardon. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hi, Norma Jean. Hi. Thanks for coming and telling your scintillating stories today. That was, we're all sitting at the table with our jaws on the floor. <laughs> uh, we're all Canadian at my table. We're from Maggie's, some of us. And yes. believe me, our laws aren't as draconian as yours, but they're fucking stupid nonetheless. Yeah, well, you know, it's very interesting. You're talking about Canada. And just the other day, there's a big story out of Cambodia and they're talking about the police corruption and everything and how badly they're treating the sex workers. And I'm like, honey, you gotta come to California. You'll see exactly the same thing. Yeah. Whether you're in Cambodia, whether you're in China, where, by the way, they execute madams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a really lovely thought, except as long as you're paying off the cops in China, yeah. you can work just like California. Okay, but here's the thing. So you're saying that our laws need to change, yes. right? And I, this is the second time I'm coming up here sort of talking about the G20 that happened in Toronto uh, last month and it was absolutely devastating. And we thought we lived in a democracy until all of our rights were taken away from us. And you all must go online and see what the fuck happened in Toronto with the G20 because let me tell you, it was outrageous. And, you know, I mean, all kinds of people, queer people were targeted, threatened with rape. All of us were subject to the same things that we as queers and sex workers know have a relationship. We have a relationship with the constabulary like that already. So I don't know if changing the laws is going to work because we live in a rather democratic country or so we thought. And that was fucking bullshit, I'll just say. You're right, and it's not just about changing the laws, it's about changing the attitudes. And like I said, when I first talked about ice face, it's about education. Yeah. You really have to educate people. And I go out and I speak to at least four, five, six colleges every year. And those young people, they are gonna make a difference. And if, if, if I and then everybody else goes out and you're willing to speak to colleges and you speak to these young people and you tell them, Look, you guys can make a difference for us. If you think we're victims, we are victims, but not victims of our work. We're victims of the law. And we need to change these laws and we need to educate people. And one of the reasons why in the, in the new book that I'm working on, um, I have a lot of interesting and entertaining stories too, because I want people to read it. I don't want to just like, God damn, son of a bitch, these idiotic laws. Because nobody will listen. 
Well, I think they would if you actually did a book on tape, because I would listen to you <laughs> tell your stories with all the amazing voices you oh. do. Well, you should see when I speak at the colleges, I tell them about my, my, my um, Julia Child client. I had a client who fantasized about Julia Child. <laughs> It was my, you know, Julie Child. I, I sure do. Sure. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna go sit down. Then. Go sit down. So my, my client, uh, I had to go to this particular store and buy a chicken, dead, of course, and take it to his house. And I would get undressed and put on an apron and my five-inch heels. And I would go down to the kitchen and I would take this chicken. And I would talk like Julie Child, and I had to go to the library and get some uh, tape so I be able to talk like her. So. This is Julia. I'm going to take this far-reaching breast and I'm going to pour this hot, dripping juices all over this far-meaty breast. Oh, this meat is so tender. And so while I was, what, what is it? Um, while I was getting the chicken rating, ready, he was basting the bird, or vice versa, one of those two. But anyway, um, I, I, students love that story. I love that story because, you know, my client didn't care that I tell tales, because nobody knows him anyway. He's not famous, he's not, well, he is rich, but he's not famous. But, I mean, it was like one of the best experiences I ever had, except it was a difficult thing for a lot of the women to fulfill his fantasy because they would start laughing, you know? And so the last woman that the madam that I worked for sent to see him, um, she started laughing so hard and he uh, chased her down the street and threw the chicken after her. <laughs> so anyway, I know that my time is up and it's time to move on, but I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. And do come up and pick up one of the things on the the consequences of bad laws. Thank you.